Hello everyone, Professor T here. In this lecture, I'm going to help you understand how we perceive the world, more specifically through vision, taste, and smell. Therefore, you will learn about how specific stimuli, such as light and chemical molecules, trigger those senses, their relevant body and brain anatomy, and signaling pathways all the way to the brain. Hopefully, you will also soon understand why I've titled this lecture, Perception is Not Reality. Perception is not a snapshot of reality. Instead, it is a subjective construction in your mind and brain that projects your own experiences, beliefs, expectations, and awareness onto objective reality. This is what I mean when I say that perception is an illusion. You don't have to look far to find numerous examples of this basic point. Take, for example, individuals who suffer from the condition synesthesia or reunion of the senses, where stimulation of one sensory cognitive or cognitive pathway leads to automatic and involuntary experiences in a second sensory or cognitive pathway. Synesthetes are otherwise normal people who may, for example, smell odors when they hear musical notes, taste colors, or even hear shapes. Or, in a less extreme example, consider how the same stimulus, say the herb cilantro, can be a delightful treat to some, but to others it can outright taste like soap or perfume. And, of course, the myriad optical illusions out there that may make you wonder whether your brain is on a hallucinogenic trip. Perception is not reality. Our sense organs, such as the eyes, ears, skin, nose, and tongue, allow us to perceive various types of energies or stimuli outside our bodies. These are the basic senses of vision, hearing, touch, smell, and taste, each of which rely on specialized sensory receptors in order to process light, sound waves, pressure, temperature, pain, and different chemical substances. Based on more recent research, we could also extend perception beyond the five classic senses and also add interoception, or the perception of sensations from inside the body, like your heartbeat, proprioception, sensing your muscles and bones, vestibular kinesthetic perception, etc. But we will stick to the basics in this lecture. So, what about visual perception? You may like to look at roses, but your dog will certainly prefer to smell them. As you likely know, visual perception differs widely among species. Dogs are no exception, having what we call dichromatic vision, which is simpler than humans' trichromatic color perception. But we are getting ahead of ourselves. So you see with your eyes, right? Not. You see and taste and smell with your brain, obviously. Otherwise, you wouldn't be learning about this in your psychology class. Of course, the eye is important, even essential for vision, but that's just the beginning. What is the pathway for visual perception, then? Light is the external stimulus that is reflected off of objects and enters the eye through the pupil, that hole in the center of the iris, the color part of your eye, um, and is then subsequently focused by the cornea and the lens onto the back surface of the eyeball known as the retina. This is where a lot of the action happens because the retina is lined with visual receptors, what we call photoreceptors. Here is where transduction occurs, converting that physical stimulus in the form of light into nerve impulses that the brain and nervous system can understand. The retina creates a neural code, if you will. From there, nerve signals is, are carried out by the optic nerve, the cranial nerve 2, through the optic chiasm just above the pituitary gland, where the two optic nerves from the right and left eye meet, and continues on through two different routes, one headed for complex visual processing in the visual cortex of the occipital lobe that also first passes through the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, that sensory relay station, 
and a smaller tract headed for the superior colliculus in the midbrain, where visual process, basic visual processing occurs. Let's zoom in on the retina for a moment. This is a thin layer of nerve tissue, as I mentioned before, at the very back of the eyeball that senses light. It contains specialized sensory cells or photoreceptors called rods and cones due to their shape. Rods and cones here in color. Which convert light energy into nerve signals. You can think of the retina as the film in an old-fashioned camera that is sensitive to light. Rods outnumber cones by about 20 times, but are only sensitive to dim light and do not provide color vision. Cones, on the other hand, though outnumbered and mostly located in a small region of the retina called the fovea, are responsible for about 90% of the brain's input and, importantly, allow for color vision. Both rods and cones contain photopigments, or opsins. These are chemicals that release energy when struck by light, such as rhodopsin in rods and several color pigments in cones. As a first line of photoreceptor, a photoreception then, rods and cones send signals to other layers of retinal sensory neurons called bipolar cells and ganglion cells. It is the axons of ganglion cells that join one another to form the optic nerve that travels to the brain's visual cortex. I'm showing here a ventral view as an alternate illustration of visual pathways seen from the bottom of the brain and also more medially towards the center. So we have the retina and the optic nerve. Optic chiasm turns into optic tract in the central nervous system. Remember, the optic nerve is technically part of the peripheral nervous system. It's a cranial nerve. But then it transforms, if you will, into a tract, which is within the CNS. Then we have the LGN of the thalamus on either side of the brain right and left hemispheres, and then it continues on through these optic radiations or these nerve fibers onto the back of the brain um, in this posterior lobe that we call the occipital lobe and the primary visual cortex. What happens then once the nerve signals from the eye reach their final destination in the brain? Well, following basic processing, in the thalamus and midbrain, such as increasing signal-to-noise ratio and visual reflexes respectively, it is the turn of area V1, or primary visual cortex, to engage in more complex visual processing. Here, signals received from the LGN of the thalamus are processed for features such as orientation, spatial frequency or pixels, and color. V1 then sends signals to V2, the secondary visual cortex, for further processing of illusory contours, binocular disparity, and figure versus ground. Information is transferred back and forth between area V1 and V2 in a reciprocal fashion. It is also believed that cells in the visual cortex are what we call feature detectors neurons that preferentially respond to the presence of particular features or stimuli, stimuli, such as lines or edges. These cells, in turn, send information to neural networks called supercell clusters that can perform tasks such as recognizing whole objects, like individual faces, for example. But the brain's visual processing does not stop at the occipital lobe. From here, it splits into two main streams. The dorsal wear stream, headed toward the parietal lobe for spatial processing, and the ventral what stream, headed toward the temporal lobe. As their names imply, the dorsal stream is responsible for object location in space, and the ventral stream allows for identification and recognition of objects. So, now you can understand why I say that you see with your brain. Interestingly, however, in the condition known as 
cortical blindness or blind sight, individuals respond to visual stimuli without consciously perceiving them. That is, due to damage to some visual cortices, they are unaware of the fact that they are able to conduct very basic visual processing that typically relies on lower brain structures, like the superior colliculus. Snakes have infrared receptors, pits, that sense heat beyond a human's ability to detect. Of all types of energies out there in the universe, humans are able to perceive only a few, as we have established in our introduction of sensory receptor types. Within the broad electromagnetic spectrum, human sensory and perceptual scope is relegated to a narrow band of wavelengths between ultraviolet and infrared rays that we call visible light. So, what about color vision in particular? Certain wavelengths measured in nanometers or billionths of a meter are perceived as color. Perception of color is dependent upon the wavelength of the light. The shortest wavelength humans can perceive is about 400 nanometers which is the violet part of the rainbow, and the longest is 700 nanometers, the red part, just before infrared light. Presuming, then, that we don't have a separate receptor for every possible color, how many types do we have? Three. Short wavelength, or blue, medium wavelength, or green, and long wavelength, or red. And these are our cone photoreceptors. According to the young Hel Helmholtz theory of color perception, and there are others, color discrimination depends on a combination of responses by different photoreceptors and neurons. That is, in other words, when you perceive um, a stimulus as a certain color, it is actually a ratio of activity across the three types of cones. For example, as shown here, the light reflected off of this leaf activates medium wavelength cones at 90%, long ones at 55 and short ones not at all. You perceive the leaf as green. Neat, right? But is your green the same as my green? I'll let you ponder this philosophical question about qualia at your leisure. But as a clue, Let's look at more extreme examples of the subjectivity of color perception. Other species. Visible wavelengths are dependent upon the species receptors. Is your green the same as your dog's green then? Some people say that dogs have black and white vision. In fact, they are lacking red-green receptors and instead have only yellow-blue. So their vision has simpler color perception, dichromatic, not monochromatic. Cats can see much better in dim light, shown here at the bottom, than humans, shown here at the top. Cat's eye is specialized to see in dim and changing light, and to achieve this it sacrifices detailed vision, and some color vision. It is the vision of a hunter, active in both day and night. Lastly, we see here three different views of an egg. On the left, as most humans would perceive it, in the middle, a simulated ultraviolet vision only, and on the right, a simulated bird vision, this particular type of bird, that has tetrachromatic vision. In other words, not only red, green, and blue photoreceptors, but also ultraviolet receptors. Cool, right? Now that you know all about vision, let's turn to the chemical senses. Taste and smell, or olfaction. Chemical sensitivity is one of the earliest sensory systems which allowed humans to locate food, avoid danger, and find mates. As such, the sense of smell and taste are intertwined. There are five well-recognized tastes. Sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami, a type of savory, meaty taste. 
There's also growing acceptance of fat as a sixth basic taste. Like me, you may have been under the impression that there are specific zones on the tongue for each of the five tastes. Not so. According to recent research, that is a myth. The fact appears to be that all tastes can be perceived everywhere on the tongue. So what exactly is taste? Upon ingesting a food or substance, chemicals responsible for taste are released in the mouth and come into contact with neuron-like gustatory receptor cells found within taste buds. The taste buds are located in the walls and grooves of the papilla, shown here, these little bumps on the tongue. And whereas most taste buds are located in the tongue, they can also be found as widely distributed as on the palate, the roof of the mouth, the cheeks, back of the throat, and nasal cavity. Once taste receptor cells are activated, a cascade of events takes place that causes these sensory cells to transmit messenger substances. Um, sweetness, bitterness, and umami use G-protein coupled receptors with ATP as a neurotransmitter, actually which in turn activate further nerve cells that then pass information for a particular perception of flavor onto the brain. So we can see here the papilla, a blown up of it, a blow up of it, and then taste buds within it, and a blow up of the taste bud here, and uh, the receptor cells that are found within them with the nerve fibers going to the brain. Showing here a blow up of taste buds that have this sort of flower button shape. Adults have between two to four thousand taste buds, which are shaped like flower buttons, as I mentioned. And the sensory cells in the taste buds are renewed once a week. About half of the sensory cells react to several of the basic five tastes, whereas the other half of sensory cells are specialized to react to only one taste. This way, you get a fantastic and varied combination of flavors. This, so this is a fun fact. Hot and spicy are not tastes. They are pain and temperature nerve signals. The substance capsaicin in foods causes a sensation of pain and heat. Capsaicin binds to a special class of receptors inside our mouths called VR1 receptors, whose main purpose is actually thermoreception, or the detection of heat, as well as response to intense mechanical stimulation, such as pinching and cutting. But VR1 receptors are also respond to certain chemical influences. As a result, when they are activated by capsaicin, we subjectively experience heat and pain. Confused neural receptors? Perception is not reality. Are you a super taster? Super tasters are sensitive to all tastes and mouth sensations. They have stronger taste preferences in the forms of firm likes and dislikes, and most avoid spicy foods, but that depends on culture, familiarity, etc. What happens after stimulation from chemical substances is converted into neural signals by sensory receptor cells? Well, the transfer of the taste signals to the nervous system is accomplished by several cranial nerves that are shown here. Cranial nerve 7, also known as the facial nerve, that responds to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. Cranial nerve 9, or the glossopharyngeal, which responds to the posterior one-third of the tongue. And cranial nerve 10, which should be familiar to us, the vagus nerve, and it responds to stimulation, the epiglottis, here. So... This information is carried along the cranial nerves to the nucleus of the solitary tract in the medulla in the brainstem. And from there, axons head to the thalamus, that's sensory relay station, and then to areas 
of the brain that are responsible for conscious taste perception, like, for example, the insula and other areas associated with other senses like smell, such as the pyriform cortex near the amygdala. Which brings us to our final topic, smell perception or olfaction. Both our smell and taste receptors are activated by chemicals in the air or food. As you can see here, airborne odors, food chemicals, activating our olfactory system, smell, as well as our taste system. Why can't you taste food when you have a cold? What we call flavor is a combination of our senses of taste and smell, which react to chemical molecules in the food and in the air. Your nasal and oral cavities are connected at the back of your throat. But when your nasal cavity becomes congested with mucus, it prevents the food molecules from activating your smell receptors. Therefore, food tastes bland or not at all when you have a cold. Like most taste cells, olfactory receptors are also G-protein coupled and sensitive to chemicals. We sense the smell of food by two routes, whereas sniffing through our nose is called orthonasal smell. The scent released up through the back of our mouth into our nose when we chew and swallow food is called retronasal smell. The latter is the most important route for sensing the aroma of food and is believed to account for as much as 80 to 85 percent of the flavor of food. As mentioned before, this explains why we can't detect the flavor of food when we have a cold and our nose is blocked. Ever catch a scent and get instantly teleported to a different time and place? Unlike any other sensory center in the brain, like for vision, hearing, or touch, the olfactory bulbs are smell centers shown over here, right underneath our forehead, um, have direct connections to two other brain areas that are strongly involved in memory and emotional processing, the amygdala and the hippocampus. This may be why scents are so quick to trigger emotions and memories, bypassing sensory relay stations and directly stimulating our emotional and memory centers. Another fun fact that you may have noticed, women tend to have a better sense of smell than men, perhaps due to women having 50% more neurons and glia in the olfactory bulbs. That's it, everyone. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to visualize and explain visual taste and smell anatomy and pathways. Explain the activation of pathways by specific stimuli, for example, light and chemicals. And apply neural transmission concepts to sensory perception. Catch you on the next video lecture, everyone. Take care.